Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. But as we approach the Jewish High Holy Days, we might want to remind ourselves of the Shema Yisrael from passages from Deuteronomy and Leviticus, which Jesus came to call the Great Commandment. How are we doing with those commandments? Yeah. Muscle <laughs> minus. <Awesome>, yeah. <laughs> so so. Right? Now, I'm going to set aside the fact that Unitarian Universalists are famously allergic to commandments um, and just make an invitation to think expansively of the concept of God here, the most holy, the sacred in our midst, spirit of life, love everlasting. How many of us have already offered up our praise and reverence, all our hearts, all our souls, all our might? How many of us have already done that this morning? hard, right? Hard to orient ourselves in quite that way as we're getting through life. And so how are we doing with the wish to avenge, the bearing of grudges, the loving of our neighbors? As I did with God, let me get expansive here. Not just the people who live next door, but the people who live and think and speak very differently than we do. How's that love going? Who feels fantastic about all the warm fuzzies that you've sent already today to those who are unlike you? Anyone? Especially if we've read the news or been on social media, it's pretty tough to be in both of those places, loving that Lord our God and loving our neighbor, not bearing any grudges in this political season. Are you kidding me? You may have noticed lately that a lot of the rules that used to be taken for granted about political speech and elections, and just how to behave in general, are being broken. Both the letter and the spirit of public discourse seem to have no boundaries these days. He can't say that, can he? She didn't just, she did. Thanks in large part to the speed and major capacity of social media helped along by the impulsiveness of our candidates and their supporters, we've had lots of fodder for outraged amazement over the last many months. Thinkers and writers on the left and on the right have been busily attempting analysis of this phenomenon. There are lots of competing diagnoses for the problem. Calls for a return to civility for taking up greater activism and not compromising a thing when so much is at stake. Appeals to return to values and practices that informed social change in the past. Suddenly, people are even waxing nostalgic for the tumultuous time of 1968. To use a technical term of social analysis run through a translator to make it suitable for church, things are awfully messed up. <laughs> there was a similar thing happening in Jesus' time. Economic distress and social disruption were rampant. The political and religious order of the day were scrambling hard to keep power, using every means necessary to try to subdue a people in great turmoil. The people were trying to find their bearings, looking for some sign of a simple, clear path to follow to know they were on the right track in the midst of a society in chaos. There were a lot of existing religious rules, which of course Jesus was known to be both well aware of and quick to defy. Some sects wanted the rule of keeping the Sabbath to be the greatest. Some wanted it to be the rule of offering sacrifice. The list went on and on and on. And so, both as a way to seek wisdom and a way to test his position, they ask the question of Jesus. What is the greatest of the commandments? And he responded with the Shema Yisrael, 
the holiest saying of Jews, the proclamation that was on the lips of the faithful in prayer twice daily, at the Sabbath feast, and on their deathbeds. The Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. For first century Judaism, this wasn't just a private kind of piety. It contained the directive that a person had to live their life in such a way that they directed others to the love of God also. Their way of life should show the goodness of God in every way. And then Jesus upped the ante on this commandment, hard enough in itself, with the second part from Leviticus. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against thy neighbor or the children of thy people. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Bringing those Jewish core teachings to the fore, the next question was, of course, who is my neighbor? And Jesus responded with the story of the Good Samaritan, so familiar to many of us, especially those of us who've been in the trenches of working for social justice. Reflecting on that passage, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. noted that it's the Greek word agape that's translated to love in English, not eros or philios, romantic or sentimental love, but agape. Not a feeling so much as a practice, the practice of being committed to the well-being of others simply because they are, and you are. Dr. King's theology and social ethic were grounded in this kind of love. You might already be familiar with a lot of his writings. And as he described it, and this I think is the hard part, agape is disinterested love. Agape doesn't begin by discriminating between worthy and unworthy people or any particular qualities they possess. It begins by loving others for their sakes. It is entirely a neighbor regarding concern for others, as he put it, which discovers the neighbor in every person it meets. Therefore, agape meets, makes no distinction between friends and enemy. It's directed toward both. If you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others may, may prevail in the world, and following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. In this age of so much information, a platform for sharing every single idea under the sun, and more ways to be connected than others, there's this paradox in which we are walling ourselves off into more and more isolated enclaves of life-thinking souls. Social media lets us spout off about anything and everything all day long, including things that would never have occurred to many of us to have an opinion about. But it also lets us control the world of ideas that comes into our awareness. Anything that challenges or offends our way of thinking is a threat, and with a click, we can turn it off. It becomes something to avoid it at all cost. And since those ideas are attached to people, those people are excised from our circles as well. If we want to get along at the office, at neighborhood parties, with parents on the playground, we do well to avoid subjects of controversy. Unfortunately, those subjects of controversy usually are the very things we care most passionately about and make us who we are. In my work at Public Conversations Project, we like to say, behind every belief is a person with a story. Right? We can think that we can engage only at the intellectual level for so long, but at some point we have to talk about what are the people's stories. The pattern that others made, my friends, is locking us off into those fortified villages. We are following the wrong God home, missing each other in the demands and presence of that larger love that holds us. These habits keep us from living into the promise of our connection, from really being able to greet each other in our fullness. And then, our God-given gifts are squandered just when they're needed most. 
So I wonder, what might we hear differently in this election year if Agape was fully engaged? What kinds of policies and practices might be proposed for our nation's well-being if we were all reminded of the fact that none of us is great if we don't enact our gifts with a love that's not conditional, whose measure is not who, who we feel good about, but extends to those we've been told to fear. It's important for awake people to be awake. If we're sure in the love of God, we're sure of a love that's not about perfection or our rightness, but a love that belongs to us simply because we are. We're freed to do the work the prophets proclaimed without needing to be liked by those who are different. Our liking them as a prerequisite for our mercy or our justice or relief does not come into play. We have to dwell in the certainty that each and all our neighbors, the person in the pew next to us whom we've known for 25 years, and the person a world away, whose ideas and norms of life we couldn't even imagine. The practice that we are called to over and over again in most religious texts, it turns out, is about offering ourselves to those whom we would love to turn away from. Politically different, religiously different, ethnically different, when we sit in simple curiosity, we bring the world of scripture into our own flesh. This isn't just an abstract possibility that I'm offering you as a lofty-minded preacher. It's one that I watch people learn to make real in our work at Public Conversations Project every day. We work locally, nationally, and globally to help people build relationship and understanding in the midst of the toughest divisions. Not necessarily to reach agreement, but to learn to live together, to be neighbors, to see and know each other fully, and take each other into account in how they choose to live their values in the world. Because at behind every belief is a person with a story. When we learn those stories, we find ways to be connected we may never have imagined. Recently, we found out some of the very tangible results of work that we did in Nigeria between 2008 and 2014, where Christian and Muslim communities have been at war with each other and among tribal factions for centuries. The town of Sokoto is a majority Muslim city. And early last year, just after a Christian business had been burned to the ground, and the subjects were, the, the perpetrators were reported to be Muslim, a Christian man driving drunk crashed his truck into the home of a Muslim family. A crowd of about 500 assembled within about an hour and the possibility of a riot was imminent. One man stepped forward from that crowd and started to ask some questions. He went to the man in the truck and instantly smelled quite a bit of alcohol. He went to the family in the house, discovering they didn't have any connection with each other previous to this. He started to have a conversation with the crowd and ask them what kind of outcome they wanted for their village. In an instant, he was able to turn what would have been further violence, further bloodshed, further escalation of the tensions that had existed into a moment of learning. The man who crashed his truck into the house had simply been drunk. The family was willing to help. Others were willing to help repair the home and create a whole new way of understanding each other as community. That man was one of 200 people who had been trained to facilitate conflict across difference by us and our partners at the Interfaith Mediation Center. Imagine 
Now this happened in a place where people were so used to loss of life, where tensions were at their peak, where lives are transformed by the loss of that kind of property. I wonder what might be unfolding for us here in the U.S. If police and school teachers, social workers, gas station attendants, researchers and bus drivers, financial executives and home health aides all had some experience of someone willing to ask a different question. A question to widen understanding and offer that ability to observe each other with the wonder that can infuse all of life. We don't have to give up our ideals or give in to another way of thinking to be curious, to engage. When we're called by the love that we are given to push through our fears, we can learn those skills of curiosity, of listening, of learning to tell our own story and be open to those of others. If history has shown us anything, our turning away from those whose ideas we despise is exactly what drives deeper divisions, propels us into alienation and despair that can and do turn deadly. Living the ethical commitment to see and know each other, we can save lives. We can release prisoners. We can untie every yoke. In the name of our faith, of our forebears who saw the radical call of this universalism and preached it far and wide, who saw in each person the ability to grow and express some light of divinity, I want to invite you to be part of this conspiracy of connection, a gathering of goodness in the form of relationship, understanding, and the fact that our differences are the greatest gifts we have to build a nation and a world worthy of passing on to our children and grandchildren. Friends, the darkness around us is deep. Our awakening to deep connection, our living in deep curiosity, our willingness to cross the chasm of belief will make the difference between our survival and our extinction as a people and as a planet. Let's find the star that we were meant to follow, and let's continually awaken together. <laughs>